So just to briefly introduce uh, Daniel. Um, Daniel is a French-born marine biologist, well known for his work in studying human impacts on global fisheries. And uh, in 2020, uh, he was uh, recognized as the most cited fishery scientist in the world. He is a professor and project leader of, of the Sea Around Us project at the Institute for Ocean and uh, Fisheries of the University of British Columbia. Now, uh, Daniel Pauli is not new to World Fish. In fact, uh, I've just been told that you know World Fish joined World. I mean, Daniel Pauli joined World Fish in 1978. And how many of you were born? In that era, but uh, uh, so Daniel Pauli has a long history with World Fish, uh, who served in World Fish for 15 uh, glorious years when it was known as the International Center for Living in Aquatic Resource Management, or in short, ICLAR, uh, in the Philippines. And at World Fish, Daniel Pauli worked in the tropics and uh, developed new methods for estimating fish populations designing, implementing, and perfecting methods using length frequency data to estimate fisheries um, statistics. Uh, let, later, he um, helped develop or created essentially fish bays, uh, the reason why many of us are here in the room today and uh, this week as well, which is um, an online encyclopedia of fish and fisheries information comprising information on more than 30,000 different species, um, which has received worldwide attention and um, through uh, multiple upgrades and additions, um, is still prominent in uh, fisheries uh, biology and its uh, service to a number of fisheries managers across the world, but particularly in the developing world. So, without further ado, um, let me invite uh, Daniel Pole to the stage. Talk to us about life and journey in fisheries, marine sciences, fish bays, and world fish. So, so looking forward to your Thank talk, you Daniel. Much. Yeah. So, so the first my pleasure to be here and um, I was planning to illustrate um, my PowerPoint with lots of nice images but uh, <clears throat> the Wi-Fi the hotel would not cooperate so uh, the, the the images will be sparse at the beginning and I will refer to a biography uh, there it is uh, that a friend a colleague wrote um, and that um, donated to the library of um, of Wallfish. And um, yeah, I will get back to it. So without further ado, um, I was born in France, in Paris, in uh, 46, and that means I'm old. And my mother was uh, uh, had spent much of World War II in uh, Germany. Um, she was part of this uh, French citizen that were dragged into Germany to work in the munition factories. He came back with a, a, a wounded leg and met my father, who was a passing North American soldier, African American. And uh, the result was this little boy. And uh, after two, at the age of two years, two, three years, I was sick. And um, uh, she met, my mother met a Swiss family um, uh, that promised to take me home, take, to take me to Switzerland where I would be uh, fixed up because I had TB or something. And uh, they never sent me back. And I grew up into in rather difficult circumstances. Um, uh, the next, uh, uh, under difficult circumstances that are kind of explain in the book. That was not nice. Um, and when I was 17, I dropped out of school. I worked a few months in Switzerland. And then I went to Germany, where I, I was a Gastarbeiter, a, a, a foreign worker, uh, working in different factories, uh, 
but going to night school uh, for four, four and a half years, where I completed the requirement for the, going to university in Germany. And so at, at uh, uh, 23, rather late, I started with uh, uh, studying in Kiel, marine biology. Uh, in the meantime, I had reconnected with my French family. I have seven siblings and my U.S. family, um, uh, one, several of which uh, are quite uh, well known. My cousin had just taken over Cornell University by way of arms. Uh, we will not elaborate, but it is, uh, you can see him here in, in the book. Um, then um, I, I studied uh, marine science uh, and specifically fishery biology with minor zoology and physical oceanography. And it was uh, uh, really a good uh, grounding, uh, you, uh, linking practical uh, practical work, field work and, uh, and lab work with a theoretical combination. Uh, the, my biographers uh, came back uh, 20 years, uh, also studied in Kiel. He's a French, but he studied in Kiel. He did the same course and he described the course as as being a very good grounding, and I was I was a, a good student, but a bit unruly uh, by way of politics, and you can read about it. Um, and uh, among other things, I did the field work for my master already when I was an undergraduate, and it it was in Ghana, and uh, uh, I studied a lagoon with a tilapia in it, um, a black chin tilapia. It's a species that uh, thrives in, uh, <clears throat> in uh, saline and uh, variable uh, estuarine environment. The, I brought this up because I always believe that uh, the work is not done until it's published. I, at the completion of my master's I, in 74, I was hired by JTZ. Not, they didn't want me, but uh, my, I have a very powerful professor who liked me and he imposed them on me, uh, them, them, me on them. And um, they, <clears throat> GTZ is very powerful and rich. And uh, I, they gave me a teacher for four months or three, four months, who taught me Swahili. It was a personal teacher. And then I learned about Indo-Pacific fish in the Senckenberg Museum. And having learned Swahili, then I was sent to Indonesia where <laughs> where they don't speak Swahili. Uh, and um, they had a project to uh, GTZ to introduce trolling in in Indonesia. At the time, at the time, uh, trolling had begun really in Manila Bay using old Jeep engine that the American had left, putting them on, bo on boats and trolling. And a German expert named Klaus Tief had observed this, and 10 years later, he introduced this into Thailand. So it's not the German really who introduced trawling into Thailand. It is, it is Philippine technology and ingenuity that was transferred. Uh, and uh, you know the, the story, it, 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 it burst out uh, trawling uh, very rapidly out of Thailand into the Malacca Strait. This is the first place outside of Thailand where it's burst out, and then later it, it went uh, to Indonesia. And, and I was instrument in this, and um, um, <laughs> it's bizarre because now I'm very much anti-trolling. Yeah. yeah. And in Indonesia, I really understood for the first time the, the, the diversity uh, of fish that you get on deck uh, of a trawler uh, at the time because the, the, the ecosystem was intact. You would get 150 species in one hole of one hour. And each species contributed two, 3% of the catch. There was no dominant species. It, therefore, it was not possible to work as we did, as we were taught in, in Germany on the important species, cod or herring and stuff, and the rest could be ignored. You had too many species. And, and the implication was that uh, you had to have a theory that encompassed all all of this, all these different fish, and and uh, I decided 
to um, to quickly return to Germany to to deal with this in uh, my dissertation. And I was aided by that by my uh, boss, who was a drunk, who didn't like me, and who did not renew my contract. So, so I'm back in Germany, and I I quickly wrote a thesis. the The field work was in a library. Uh, when one hour, one one year, I read everything there was on growth of fish, and uh, I identified factors which were not local. In other words, people when they want to explain the growth of fish, uh, they always say because in that lake there was a bloom of or there was lots of food and and uh, this is this is all nonsense actually the way fish grow is they are constrained by their anatomy specifically by the atomy, anatomy of the gills if they have big gills they can grow fast because they can get lots of oxygen to burn the food that they eat and uh, essentially that's the story now this became the basis for the the gill limitation uh, Gill oxygen uh, limitation theory, which I further developed uh, throughout my career, and of which I spoke about three days ago, two days ago. Uh, because also, also of the work that I had done in Indonesia, because most of the so-called experts that were at the time sent around, they were mainly in uh, embassy reception and, and tennis courts to be found. And uh, the, they didn't do much field work or or or, or publication, they, they had a good time, but I, I did work. And so Jack Ma, who, who was the, the founder of ICLAM in the Philippines, in Southeast Asia, ICLAM was a creation of the Rockefeller Foundation, and it was a little research unit in the University of Hawaii. And Jack Ma, who had a vast experience working in, uh, in, uh, in the Pacific, brought it to to the Philippines after scouting different locations, different countries. Uh, he, the best offers came from the Philippines. He established ICLAM in the Philippines, and he had heard about my work two, three years before, and he invited me. Uh, I was uh, working on my thesis, and he invited me to work for three months, and I didn't know what it was really. And I arrived in Manila, and he said, you're going to develop the theory of fishing in the tropics. And you know what? I, I I did consider hitting the plane and going back because the the task was inconceivable. And and I stayed on, and I ground through it, and it became the first technical publication of Eclam, and um, it was sent by Jack Ma because he had convening power to the top scientist, fishery scientists of the time, and I survived the ordeal. So. When I finished my PhD, he hired me, and then he left. He didn't have to bother with the consequences, and uh, there I was as a postdoc, and after one year or so, they, they gave me a permanent position. So there, there it is, and, and I worked like, like crazy. And I would have stayed there forever because the Philippines, I love the Philippines, the Philippines loved me, and I, I really, I really liked the work, but I had to leave because of a horror that happened. And I must say what it was. This was an attempted rape by one of my staff, but because I, I had become a director, by one of my staff trying to rape one of my uh, research assistants. And we reported that to the board. And the board, instead of firing the bastard, fired the staff or tried to fire the staff. And this is this is uh, long before the Me Too, uh, the Me Too um, time. And and it 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 is the the cause for the major crisis. And I it is my duty to report it to you because because you, you should know these things. Ah, but but the work at Eclam was absolutely exhilarating, and and the 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 gift fish were created, the tilapia that are now raised throughout the world. And for my part, I was able to do lots of things, lots of papers. I was very productive, 
and I was aided by this in this by marvelous staff, one of which or several of which are here at the time, notably Deng Palomares. Um, and and these things were uh, electronic length frequency analysis. This was a stage, the early 80s, uh, where Apple II and similar computer became available. And uh, I was uh, provided with a programmer. Um, this is a reason why I never really learned programming very well, but I, I was able to communicate via pseudocode uh, with with him and uh, and subsequent programmers. And this software is now used throughout the world, and it is uh, also the basis of uh, of subsequent software that uh, I use in use throughout the world. Uh, also, we picked up a techno uh, uh, software for uh, constructing uh, web, uh, food web, food web for performing food web analysis that was suitable very very much for use in the tropics. We we reprogram it and it uh, launched it as EcoPath 2, and uh, it is now the most widely used software for uh, for constructing food web in ecosystem. Uh, it is called EcoPath with EcoSim. It, it has now simulation in space and time, and it is a very sophisticated software, but I'm not connected with it anymore. This is a thing that is uh, independent, but uh, that uh, I was uh, instrumental in, in getting going. And we did also multiple training course in, uh, in throughout the intertropical belt in, uh, in South America with helps that in South and Latin America it helps, but uh, I speak some Spanish uh, in Africa a lot in West and East Africa in in Southeast Asia and the Caribbean and the development of fish base. Now the <laughs> fish base was the beginning of the end of Islam as conceived then. Um, in my mind, it is connected a lot with. Uh, for the first time, having to do a strategic plan, because uh, we we didn't have a plan, we just did things. Anyway, in a strategic plan, the first that we ever had, there was a paragraph saying that we would we would uh, describe the biology in of about 200 300 species of fish for maybe 500 managers in the world in a tropical world that needed the data. And I, I had, uh, I had maintained a very strong relationship with uh, with Kiel University, which was my alma mater, and uh, I connected with Rainer Froese, who was uh, at the time dabbling in artificial intelligence, which was it was beginning and databases, and uh, I, I explained that uh, we needed this, uh, and uh, he came as a consultant and decided that we would do all fish, all species, of which we thought at the time there were 20,000. Reiner, Reiner said uh, later that if he had known what he was engaging in, he would, he would never have started it because it grew. And uh, we hired people to encode data, uh, some of which in 1881, uh, sorry, 1991, some of whom are still working in uh, Los Banos in the Philippines. So fish base was a, a big, big success. Uh, we didn't know then that it would become the success that it is. Ah, and I worked 15 years as a, as a staff member from 79 to 94, and then five more years as a consultant uh, advisor to the fish base project. And uh, I was working two, seven, five months in a, in uh, Vancouver and seven months in uh, in in UBC, where I had become a professor, and I had become a professor because all the time I was in the Philippines, I I had published, and I had uh, looked at after students. I I had about twenty uh, master student in the University of the Philippines. Uh, Deng was one of them, and. Uh, I had also a PhD student in Germany uh, as adjunct professor. 
so there is a life after 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 work life in academia after working outside of academia you can enter laterally if you have if you have work as a semi academic publishing and looking after graduate look, looking after the next generation so i had as i mentioned two more years in my contract uh, at eclam at the time when i left and uh, I found myself in 99 um, having contacted or having been contacted by the a big foundation, American foundation called Pew, where I convinced them, I had convinced them to give me a huge amount of money to do a project that had been initiated while I was at Eclam, but, but uh, the catastrophe prevented me from following up on it. I had observed Erie. Erie knows everything about rice at a global basis. And there were other databases of rice in Rome, in the US, uh, various institutions knew everything about rice on a global basis. There was only one institution that had data on a global basis about fisheries, that was FAO. Other institutions always work nationally on, on, on fisheries. And I decided that we should also, Iklam at the time, also should know about fisheries on a global basis. But I was not able to do that there. And so it became, I founded the, the Sea Around Us project outside uh, at, uh, at UBC. And the first, I will now present 20 years of the Sea Around Us uh, uh, with a, a, an earlier presentation that we did um, uh, 20 years of the See around this project. And the first uh, publication that we had is a newspaper article. Uh, UBC Prof gets $1.2 million to, to do work. And uh, this was per year. So we had a huge, a huge project. The first thing that we did that was, uh, that hit the, the, the news and the press is um, a, a paper showing that uh, the North Atlantic, the best studied uh, ocean in the world, had lost um, the biomass of its big fish, had not 90% of the biomass of its big fish. And, 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 and that, that's how it looks. When in, you look at big fish only, uh, uh, with trophic level of 2.1, we have lost 90%. And if you look at cod, we have lost far more than that. And for every year, there, is, there was a story. And the story here is, uh, in 2001, we published a, a paper that showed that uh, the world catch was increasing only because China produced statistics that were false, that were exaggerated. And we published this, and it was a huge uproar. And, and we, we had uh, published that quite innocently. But but the Economist made a mockery of China, and the FAO reacted badly and didn't like it. And this, uh, even though I'd worked a lot with the FAO before, they, they reacted badly. And anyway, the, it took seven years for this to calm down. I have now excellent relationship with, with, with Chinese colleagues. And uh, the, this exaggeration that China was doing uh, they were calmly uh, repaired. They sent somebody to Rome that reduced the catch of China, reported catch by 3 million tons. So I, I made the word, we made the word lose 3,000 tons of fish, but they never had existed really. Uh, then we had a, a very good, we established very good linkages with West Africa, um, Senegal and other countries, which suffered, uh, which suffer a lot from foreign fishing. Uh, Senegal is is the, the black hole of illegal fishing, for example, from vessels that are legitimately in Mauritania or legitimately in Guinea-Bissau, and it and that fish illegitimately in in Senegal. And we assembled, then helped me do help us do that uh, a huge amount of information that would have been lost uh, and that were lost in, in, that were lost in the meantime. Uh, into a uh, CD-ROM that uh, 
should have helped people a lot. But in the meantime, Japan had intervened in West Africa and convinced with Toyota, uh, with Toyotas and other cars, the 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 various uh, Ministry of of Fisheries that overfishing had nothing to do with the resource uh, decline. It had to do with the whales. It was the whales that had done it. They had eaten all the fish. And uh, I remember a meeting where a representative of fishes was saying, we love the whales. And and they knew that the whales uh, come only for rest and recreation. They actually do not eat when they are in of West Africa. Uh, anyway, uh, so the this conference, this major conference, and, and, and the work that was done here was in part obliterated by uh, a few Toyotas and Japan intervening that it was all the, the fault of the whales. Uh, then we participated in the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment uh, with, a, with, a, with a massive involvement of the project. And among other things, it showed which, uh, uh, which uh, we made also a presentation where you see the uh, fishing spreading through the world that was used by uh, Al Gore in his in his uh, in some of his presentation. Uh, then we worked uh, on birds, on on whales and birds, basically demonstrating that yes, these animals eat fish, but they are not the reason why. Uh, where we are in trouble, um, obviously. And some of the work that we did was uh, was really appreciated by the press, and we worked with journalists a lot. And uh, we we worked on the fuel efficiency of fleet on a global basis and made it in the New York Times. Uh, that was nice, uh, and we do that from time to time uh, with articles that are successful. We also team up with the uh, economist, uh, notably with uh, Rashid Sumaila, he's a close friend and collaborator, and uh, we help with uh, estimating the amount of, 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 of government subsidies that are given throughout the world. And the, the, both Rashid and I have intervened in, uh, in uh, Geneva, try to push this, uh, this uh, discussion at the WTO. And uh, even in spite of all this effort, the last agreement is uh, is quite uh, I would say I wouldn't say negative, but it's not much. And Rashid is trying to extract some positive stuff out of it, but you have to have the degree of optimism that, that he displays to to see anything positive in it. Then I had a student. Uh, who is now a professor at uh, University of uh, New York University, who uh, who made us aware of of the need for us to comment on the rise of seafood awareness. Uh, uh, I had very much endorsed the creation of the MSC, the Marine Stewardship Council, at the beginning, but I also saw the 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 decline of this standard. And now they, they certify everything that moves, really. And uh, this certification is not a demonstration that something is sustainable, because the incentive structure of the MSC as an institution is actually wrong. Is actually they are rewarded for for and uh, financially for uh, certification. So that in the meantime they certify uh, troll fisheries, which are by definition unsustainable because they modify the environment. So we we wrote about this and uh, and uh, had quite an influence on it. Then uh, we gave some emphasis also on the use of of fish and uh, and uh, a lot of fish are discarded, about ten to twenty million tons, more than ten. It was uh, in, in the nineties was about up to 18 million tons, but it has declined to about 10 million tons. And, and then there is a huge amount of fish that is used for aquaculture. Now, nothing against aquaculture, but you cannot 
count the fish that is caught by fisheries and then the fish that is generated by aquaculture because you can have one or the other but not both and there is lots of double accounting especially by FAO. FAO tells us uh, that uh, everything increases but actually what the 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 the, the forage fish that are used for aquaculture are not available for anything else and and so it is not right to to add them up then we went big time in global change uh, gl global change is uh, is 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 a feature of of our, this century is 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 going to affect everything and with uh, the the gill area limitation theory we have a powerful tool to deal with that and uh, I, I had William Chung from Hong Kong uh, uh, he had gone a PhD at UBC as a postdoc and we and uh, we produced he went to after postdoc he went to England we got him back and we wrote the first paper that the IPCC uh, used for its uh, its summary assessment and it shows that basically because of the fish moving uh, poleward, the tropics will uh, lose fisheries, uh, will lose yield, potential yield. And uh, you see this band, uh, this, this band of tropics. And every, that was published when, in 2009, every subsequent studies has confirmed it. That was the first uh, map of the IPCC, that the IPCC had of things that happened in the ocean because all the stuff was okay then uh, i had a student analyze and we that became part of a website of the the ifmo the regional fisheries organization uh generally the ifmo do not do their job uh you can see ifmo being created uh and the year of creation and then you can see the down the downward uh, trajectory of the tuna stocks. And basically, one has the impression that the tuna stocks and have a trajectory that is completely independent of what the RFMO do. And the RFMO do this because, because uh, the, the fishing country are dominant in the RFMO, not, not the countries that would be would are adjacent to the fishing ground, but uh, Japan, Korea, uh, South Korea, Taiwan, and so on are strong in the FMO. Uh, and then we worked on reconstruction of all fish in, or, or of the catch in all countries of the world, and um, in all maritime countries of the world. And uh, I, I became a Canadian, and in the process of becoming Canadian, you must become aware of what what Canada is and is not, and and Canada has treated its its Aboriginal people abominably, abominably, and uh, one expression of this is that the Inuit, we before Eskimo, the Inuit people, um, all their dogs were killed in the 50s and 60s to force them into settlement and to make them dependent on on the government and not roam around. And, and do their own thing. This was this killing of dogs was uh, was was a catastrophe that destroyed their self worth and their self identification because mobility mobility was a very important aspect of their life and and this is connected with with fisheries because a lot of the fish that they caught was frozen to feed the dog. So that's the, that's the connection. Most Canadians don't even know about that. And then we're working also on, 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 on uh, resource species that people, that government don't care about. Uh, for example, uh, in Southeast Asia especially, and South Asia, they are enormous, and they are spreading enormous fisheries for, well, big fisheries, for jellyfish. Uh, actually, personally, I like jellyfish to eat. Uh, they are not slimy. They are crunchy because they are uh, the water is, is taken out of them. And uh, recently, we have done a similar thing 
a similar job for the, the sponges of the world, the domestic sponges that are fished uh, and uh, which which are not reported well. And FAO uh, reports in this case uh, about half, one third to one half. In the case of sponges, they report 10 percent of what is caught. And then we invented a new concept uh, and presented it in a, the, an article in Nature. Uh, that's the mean temperature of the catch. Basically, every species has a, a temperature that it prefers that it is adapted to. So, and that doesn't change rapidly. It will take thousands of years to, for it to change. So, you, you you can examine a catch of a country or of a village or whatever, and 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 compute the 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 catch uh, times uh, multiply the catch of a species with its preferred temperature, do it across all species and divide by the total catch. What you get is the mean temperature weighted by the catch. And it turns out that the mean temperature of the catch uh, behaves like temperature itself. Uh, it, it, uh, it increases in most countries uh, and in the tropics it doesn't. Why it doesn't? Because the fish, why does it increase? Because in a country like uh, I don't know in Germany, uh, the fish that are that have warm water affinities will come in and be re and the fish that have cold water affinity will leave, and so the 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 mean temperature of the catch will increase. But in, in the tropics, you have no change, and so uh, and so the mean temperature of the catch remains the same. And uh, we are now applying this to to lakes, to, to to countries, and so on. We'll apply it to all the data in our website. And uh, essentially, this becomes a measure of the effect of global change. And and characteristic, one characteristic of the global catch, of the, of the mean temperature of the catch, the fish noticed global warming long before people did. In the 80s, the fish agreed to start moving worldwide. And humans uh, are still arguing about it. And the mean temperature of the catch is a very powerful uh, uh, measure or that you will find uh, uh, lots of application of it in a special issue that are edited uh, on uh, of the of the journal environmental environmental biology of fish uh, that it will appear in at uh, in next month. And we also documented. Um, that uh, aquaculture is, at least in many countries, on a wrong track because aquaculture uh, is moving away from low trophic level species toward high trophic level species. And uh, uh, you can see that, for example, in France or in, in other Mediterranean countries where mollusks and uh, and low low trophic other low trophic level animals are carp and so on are replaced by tuna and 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 uh, and various uh, teleosts that are carnivore and that uh, remember uh, farming a carnivore does not generate any net addition of anything it this form of aquaculture consumes fish and it is very difficult to to get it in the head of people that this form of aquaculture, I call it aquaculture B for bad, uh, aquaculture B consumes fish, it doesn't produce them. And and even, even you can tell some people until you're blue in the face, they don't believe you, but it is the case that producing a salmon is a net loss of fish. Uh, it is. It would be much better if people ate the anchovies and the sardines. Then Rashid had a marvelous idea. We are in 2015. We're getting uh, toward the end uh, of what would happen if you if you close the North Sea, uh, sorry, the high seas to fishing. The high sea to fishing is the, the area of the sea beyond the exclusive economic zone. And if you close it to fishing, uh, what uh, we would still catch the same amount of fish, but we would catch it in EZ because the tuna. We catch essentially only tuna in the high seas. The tuna, uh, they alternate between the high sea and the EZ. 
and they alternate between the RC and the EZ of 20 or 30 countries, whereas only five or six countries get 90% of the catch. Japan, Korea, uh, South Korea, Taiwan, and a few other. Whereas if, if you close the high sea to fishing, you would, uh, you, they would be caught in, in the waters of a lot of countries uh, and a lot of more countries, especially in the global south, would benefit. And you can show uh, as a Gini coefficient, you can show the benefit. Um, then uh, we were done with a major project of the Sea Rounders, perhaps the biggest project that we tackled, that is the reconstruction of the catch of the world. And basically, reconstruction is our world, is a, our word for correcting, correcting the catch of the world, because the FAO, uh, essentially the Food and Agriculture Organization, uh, is a passive recipient of bad statistics. They get statistics that don't include subsistence fishing, include only half of artisanal fishing, don't include illegal catches, obviously, don't include discard, and all of these things are, can be very, very high. And uh, a, a large number of countries fish two, three times, three, four, five times more than they report to FAO. Uh, some countries do less of that. And uh, uh, the reported catch uh, is about 50% uh, higher globally than the, the the official catch, and it goes down. <laughs> it is it's going down. Uh, something that uh, you cannot see with the FAO data, because when a country improves its statistics, they don't correct the data backward, and so you have an improvement, a uh, high, a better coverage, and and it uh, makes it look as if they caught more, because they don't correct the older data. Then there is, uh, there is this theory that I, or about uh, gill area limitation that I followed, that I, I worked on parallel to the work on fisheries, and which is now reaching the foreground, certainly of my activities, because there is more interest. Because when I, when I came up with this stuff in 79, nobody could imagine that it was completely ignored because uh, global warming was not an issue. But uh, it's now an issue, and most, most textbooks, most, most, most ideas that we have in fisheries cannot deal with it. Because it's not a question, you know, when you look at fish, uh, fish biology, they, they, they always deal with the food how much food they get, how much food they need, how they transform it, and so on. But it's not a question of food. Uh, it's a question of oxygen. Uh, and, and, and global warming is, uh, is, a, is an issue of oxygen supply and oxygen demand. And uh, they, most colleagues are simply not equipped co and intellectually to deal with it, conceptually. And uh, we have to, to change the, the really the base of the of their thinking in biology to for them to accommodate to be able to deal with global warming another development which here i have 2018 um is uh, the invention by Rainer froze who was the partner in developing fish base of a new technique for stock assessment which uh, which requires only a time series of catches it doesn't required much more. If you have more, it's better, but but but, but it doesn't require it. And this require this uh, is possible only because you can you can uh, uh, use computers. Uh, the the theory is could have been implemented 100 years ago, but you could not uh, study the alternative, uh, the thousand and hundred thousand of alternative that have to be picked that have to be uh, drawn from which you pick the, the, the proper the trajectory. And uh, this is uh, connected, therefore, with the advent of fast computers. And uh, the, this method is uh, going through the world uh, in, the, in the form of courses, in the form of papers, 
courses that we give. We have developed uh, uh, videos, to training videos in uh, several languages. You can hear more about that. And uh, people are using that uh, crazy. And uh, um, we could uh, therefore assess how much fish is left in the ocean. And it's uh, diminishing quite rapidly. And uh, I'm now finished almost because uh, because this was done in 2020 and we therefore reached 2020. Uh, and then there was a little thing about the funding and the fact that uh, our funding uh, is declining. Uh, and the conclusion is that in the end, I was able to realize my life plan of of uh, working mainly in the tropics and doing things that ended up being found useful by quite a few people. And for the rest of my professional life, I will I will I will work on fish base and the sea around us, and I will uh, further attempt to develop the Gill uh, limitation area theory because without it, people cannot really understand ocean warming and deoxygenation. Thank you very much. And uh, the great deep nitty gritty details or, and uh, the, the, the various scandals, they're all, they're all there. Uh, yeah. So thank if you, you want much. to ask questions, yes, I, I will. Thank you very much, uh, Daniel, um, for this very inspiring uh, presentation. What a journey you've had. And you continue to have a very exciting journey, but also incredible legacy. Um, of course, you know, you remember a few days ago I shared my story. Yes. Um, even though I didn't know you in person, but I think uh, we've always been connected yes. through your work, which is, I think, is really incredible. And I'm sure that's shared by a number of people in the room as well. Um, so um, just to, this is going to be a slightly informal conversation. And I have a question for you just before we go into the serious questions um the first question i was just out of curiosity is um what would your message be to your young self imagine daniel Pauli you're going to be all right yeah uh i was lucky I, I had as a kid i i had a miserable i was in a miserable family but i had like in a disney movie um a uh, 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 godmother uh a fae, uh, what is it called? A fairy godmother. I, I really did. And uh, she, she was blonde and everything, like a real fairy godmother in, in Disney movie. And every month or two months, uh, they took me to their home. Once just they scrubbed me, I mean washed, and they put me in clean clothes. And, uh, and uh, I was eating with table manners and stuff. And uh, then I got back to the dump where I was, and and having this window meant that I could I could imagine a world to get out, that you get out, and that it need it didn't need to be much, but I knew that there was something out there, and this, then the the I had the option of going to night school and uh, catch up on on my uninterrupted education. And then I had uh, immense luck with my advisor, uh, my German advisor, whom I'm still friend with, even, even still, a, still old as can be. Then I had immense luck in Jack Ma hiring me because uh, I had a beard and a, you know, I was kind of maybe aggressive or, or strong, but he, he gave me a chance immense luck and uh and then i had this luck uh of of getting a job in university of british columbia and and so i had i've never uh, i never had uh something that knocked me down but uh I, I was lucky and i i knew how to how to use this this branch that was uh, that that was offered to me like like when jack ma got me to write this, if I I could have left, but I I stuck it out. So so I think the the message is going to be all right if you work. 
I like that. Yeah, I think that very positive message. Now, always want to go back to my young self and tell. I think things are going to be all right. Yeah. So thank you very much. That's very inspiring, uh, Daniel. Um, I, I will open this uh, floor for Q and A um, in a minute. But also, I think uh, just in terms of your motivation in uh, uh, getting into fishery science, but also your obsession obsession with data. I, I see some similarity there as well because I think when you were interested too. Uh, prove one of test one of your hypotheses. Then I think you were looking for data, and the data was not there. It is an organized yeah. form. And I, I shared a similar experience, you know, as a um, as a fishery scientist in a, one of the youngest nations in the world. You know, um, faced with the problems of clutter, which is lack of this taxonomy classification and well, ar arrangement of the the fish resources, but also what I describe as data poverty as well. That led to frustration, and that led to obsession with data as well. So I guess the question is, how far have we come now in terms of where we were in the 1970s, 80s and 90s and today? I, th I think they should yeah, be. How far are we in the yeah. journey? I, I think the, maybe that's because I don't like field work. Um, <laughs> I think there should be more meta analysis uh, because uh, meta analysis of data that exists now because uh, this is a, an incredibly cost-effective way of generating knowledge. Uh, you, you, the museums, the, the various institutions generate field data, and, and yet uh, there are too many of this, data, too much of this data that is not analyzed. And, uh, and people, I even have heard it a few days ago, we need more data, but actually, no, we need more people willing and capable of analyzing the data that we have instead of whining about the data not being there i in fact i got the pew grant the massive pew grant of several of, of more than one million dollar per year over 15 years because there were five or six people senior very senior people that uh, pew said okay if i if you if i found you what would you do to ameliorate the situation, to bring some insight. And they would say, we would collect more data because we don't have data. That is an automatic response. And I positioned myself, I was the youngest uh, at the time, I positioned myself to be last. And I said, I would analyze the, the FAO data set, uh, uh, improve on it. And, and I knew that it would, could be done because I had just published the paper on fishing down marine food web uh, in, in science, so you could, you can actually, even with bad data, if you if you if you account for this, um, obviously any genomics and uh, taxonomy, all of this needs to 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 have real new data, but a huge amount of policy relevant data is already available, and. Yesterday, a colleague uh, who teach in uh, one of the universities in, in Kuala Lumpur was saying that the government of Malaysia is now realizing that the fish is need managing. Well, they, <laughs> I remember a paper being written in the 80s about about uh, there there was too many trawlers, and 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 they are managing misery because at the time there were were more fish there. So by 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 waiting for more data instead of, of of analyzing what you have and 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 making a, a policy based on that um yeah i like it i think uh, essentially your message being sort of we need to be very pragmatic yeah in a way as opposed to waiting data and we end up sort of you know managing crisis yeah <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Daniel. Um, let me open the floor for Q and A now, colleagues. If you have any questions, hi Daniel. Um, thanks for that. That was fascinating. It's really nice to hear your your personal perspective over, especially seeing all those kind of the the time series of all of those publications. My question is is um, regarding a somewhat contentious uh, documentary of sorts that came out, um, Sea Spiracy, which I know you have yeah. thoughts and you. And you commented on which I, I looked at with real interest, and I, and not not specifically about that because it's not not that important. But I wonder on your insight in thinking about data and how it converts into 
behavior change, you know, policy change, uh, things, and how how important is that type of communication, even if it's not factually, you know, critically accurate. Do you still see it as important, even if, um, yeah. even if perhaps it's not the the word coming from the scientist's mouth? Because yeah. I once read a book called "Don't Be Such a Scientist," <laughs> uh, which is all about how yeah. we should communicate ideas and, and things. So I just wondered, you on it's a bit of an open question, but your perspective on that. So I, I very much believe in in outreach. Uh, we have in our project an outreach position. And, and and really, this is money well spent. And uh, I very much believe in interviews and films. And in fact, they're going to be a film based on the book. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, hold your breath. Uh, so the Sea Spiracy was a film that should have been, we should have liked because uh, it exposed what the horror of uh, of industrial fishing and and its destruction that it does, but it was a tract for not eating fish. It was a tract for vegetarianism, veganism, and and as such, it was it was disrespecting the millions of people who to whom fish is 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 important and it is essential. Also, it was tinged with with anti-Asian racism. That was clear, and uh, I don't like this kind of operation. And I I wrote uh, a negative review of it that was picked up a lot in social media. So far, I know because I don't look at social media, but uh, I was told so. And uh, one of my students, who is vegetarian, uh, said I, this was miserable because. This was the first time that I was uh, that Ray Hilborn of the of the University of Washington, who is positioning himself as my enemy uh, and writing that I'm no good and stuff. Uh, that we we were in the same had the same position, which is that uh, she she told me anything you do that this former student of mine anything you do that. That Hillborn thing is good is no good, uh, but uh, it was too much. And the the tragedy with fisheries is that is that we waste so much. We waste opportunities to have more fish, cheaper, with less fishing, and uh, more jobs. More because the job can be in in. Uh, in the down down the chain rather than catching, and and all of this we catch because because the minister doesn't understand that if you fish too much, uh, you're gonna have less fish. You see, most most uh, productive venture, uh, most most part of the economy, when you have an input, you increase. If you increase the input, you increase the output. So in agriculture, fertilizer, water, and stuff, you you always. It might not uh, it might not increase rapidly, but it always increased. So in manufacturing, yeah. So a minister of fisheries who comes from from agriculture or engineering or something will expect will expect that more fishing, but fishing not fishing is not an input to producing fish. This is collection, collecting what nature has produced. And when you tell them that, they think you're a nature freak and a tree hugger. Right, you almost immediately disqualify yourself when you talk about nature producing the fish. But that's what they do. That's what it does. And and so they they cannot. So you you may have a discussion like this. We we have to to get more fish. Yep. And we have to get more boats. No, you if you get more boats, you're gonna get less fish. Uh, and then you you are immediately disqualified because obviously you don't know what you're talking about. Uh, and and then you can you can heckle the minister, but and they have a fine suited uh, businessman who will tell them uh, who the troll industry and I will produce more fish and and he will produce more fish, but they will be taken for from artisanal fishers who are pauperized. That happened in India. That happened in 
in the Java C everywhere. The, the 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 trawlers can get money because they they pauperize the artisanal fishers. I know. I think that's a very interesting point that you made. To be perfectly honest with you, I don't think I have understood that logic or that way of rationalizing the policymakers, you know, view, which is somebody you know who comes from the Ministry of Fish Agriculture, for instance, you know, who would always expect more input in order yeah. to produce more output, right? And that really took me back into uh, uh, some years ago in Bangladesh, where the current prime minister was championing this blue economy, and um, essentially the the objective was how to tap into deep sea fishing, and therefore how do we bring in more sophisticated, you know, vessels yes. in order to harvest now, it? Now, yeah. deep sea, yeah. The, the, in South, especially in South Asia, but yeah. also in Southeast Asia. I remember the mm. Minister of Fisheries from Malaysia yeah. a few decades ago mm. was saying we, we have to go in the deeps. And what happens in the tropics is the, the stuff that falls down from the illuminated layer is eaten up on the way down by bacteria. And very little of it reaches the, the ground. So you get a, a big benthic production at the bottom of the sea down to 50, maybe 150, maybe 100 meters. And that's uh, the fringe uh, shelf around the continent. In deep water, ain't nothing. And you have an accumulation of fish, but if you fish them, they, they are not replaced. So the minister and Indian ministers in particular think that they are also from another caste, mind you. Uh, they think that uh, the fishers don't are stupid. They think the fishers are stupid and they don't go offshore because they are stupid. What they don't know is that in India, uh, off India, off the Indian coast, if you go 200, 300 meters depth, you have um, uh, epoxic water. You have water without no oxygen. And there is no fish in without oxygen. And 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 the hydrology, the physical oceanography around India is well known since the 60s, but they still want to go fishing deep and they buy the boats. And what do the boats do? They go inshore. Exactly. Yeah. But also, I think the is how little we know about the deep sea as well, right? Um, I'm not sure if you know Diva Emon, you know, who's a great sort of deep sea biologist. And uh, I heard her speak about one of these particular species, and she was saying, for well, that fish, it takes that fish about 70 odd years to reach yeah. the age of puberty. So <laughs> that's the level of complexity. What that means is that the recovery also takes yeah. forever. Yeah. Right. OK. Um, any more questions? Rainier, please. Yeah. Yeah. It's it. The, I I hate to say it's a good question because I hate to hear that when I say something. Uh, the Somebody says it's a good question. Well, I'm not. Anyway, it was a good question uh, because because that is a question that every scientist should ask him or herself. Basically, our our in our democracies and not democracies, the the system is not geared to listen to scientists. The system is geared to listen to entrepreneurs, to lawyers maybe, and to the military. But scientists are not don't have a voice, direct voice. And and so the until recently the the I say the British view that scientists should be in in their in their place and 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 they they do science and then somehow uh, that policy will will emerge that that doesn't work anymore especially not with global warming and 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 deformation and and. The, this horror that is unfolding on of us. But the question remained, you still can, cannot be an advocate. So how do you negotiate this? That was your question. I think for myself, I've negotiated as follow. I watched the NGO community. I watched what they do and what they say they need and what they need that I can see. Because it's not necessarily the same, what they say they need as information and what they would need if they, if somebody worked for them. Anyway, so I watch them and I, I orient the science I do to 
help them. But I stay within, with a science, in the, within the publishable sphere, because you cannot publish a rant. You cannot publish, except in a social media, but you cannot publish a rant. You, you, you cannot publish even an opinion. You have to back out. Back, uh, back up everything that you say with evidence. So in your scientific papers, you do the science, but nothing prevents you from, as a private citizen, to join an NGO. Now, Greenpeace might be a bit strong for most people. Um, on the other hand, some people have been characterizing the, the WWF as poodles. That's what I heard the first time. The, that WWF is is too timid, and probably uh, within that there is a range of, of 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 NGO, local, international, that need advice, uh, scientific advice, that need scientists as members, that need scientists as sympathizer, and uh, I advise every young scientist to ask me to either join or be supportive of an NGO, local or international. And for myself, I'm in the board of two NGOs, Oceana and, and a, a French NGO called Bloom. And, and my position vis-a-vis -vis these uh, NGOs, I cannot smuggle them in the scientific papers I write because the editor and uh, the, the, the reviewers will not let me get away with it. And so, so I'm, so I am maintained I'm in a proper company, in a in a proper line of argument, and 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 a scientist, and I can still, because I live in a democracy, I can still uh, express my opinion uh, on general issues uh, in interviews and and so on. So one can do both. That's what I'm saying. Thank you very much, uh, Dana. Great question, a great response. Um, uh, sorry, Anis or Hafiz, if there are any questions online, let me know. But let me ask the floor again if you have any questions directed to Daniel. Um, if not, I will just build on that uh, discussion. Um, but just before I do so, I think today you also beyond fishery science, he also touched upon some legal jurisdictions, for instance, in the way we manage uh, our fish resources through RFMOs, for instance, and questioning uh, uh, the, the effectiveness of that management, but also the issue of the high seas, you know, where you have imaginary uh, legal boundaries that do not necessarily reflect sort of the ecological connectivity. Yeah. Right of fish and the habitats, etc. Right. Yeah. So um, I guess I mean the 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 question then for me is in a, what's what's the answer to that? Right. Well, yeah. The the UNCLOS, uh, the U United Nations Law of the Sea, um, Convention on the Law of the Sea, was a major breakthrough and major advance uh, in the sixties, nineteen and sixties. Some Latin American country, or South American countries, Chile and Ecuador and Peru, uh, claimed a big uh, uh, mar patria, they call it, a uh, patriotic sea of 400 miles. And, uh, and that was a bit much. And uh, at the time, everybody said these claims are completely crazy, this will not work, and uh, this is unacceptable. And among the people who were saying that were the Soviet delegates. Remember the Soviet Union? Whoops, it's gone. And what 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 became set up is a, a exclusive economic zone of 200 miles for every country in the world, except Singapore. There's no space in the Johor Strait for 200 miles. But uh, 200 miles uh, exclusive economic zone. That made it possible for every country in the world, in principle, to regulate most of their fisheries because most of, most of the fisheries for example, of Indonesia, except tuna, they are in Indonesia, and they can. It becomes possible for every country to regulate the fisheries. The 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 mess we have is, is in the high seas, and basically because the high seas are not owned by anybody, uh, 
in effect, they are owned in terms of resource by big companies that can exploit them. And if there were no fishing in the high seas, you could catch the tuna, all of them. You could catch them that are caught now when they get into the into the uh, and and uh, into the EZ of countries, and that would solve a huge amount of problem, including slavery at sea and and so on, because because they would be all under national jurisdiction. But right now, lawlessness uh, in the high seas is rampant and is a big problem, including slavery, and that. The best way to do that is to not fish in the high sea. And is it enforceable? Well, yes, we can see every boat from 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 satellite. So it would be very easy. It would be quite easy. So I think this is something that in 20 years will seem obvious. Just like the Mar Patria of, of Peru and Ecuador have been realized that uh, at the time, uh, a, a few decades after they were proposed and uh, when people thought it was completely crazy. Very much, Daniel. I, I'm immensely enjoying this conversation, by the way, uh, Daniel. Um, I, I stumbled across a, a very old Iklarm document, um, an interview with one of those senior leaders at that point in time. Sorry, I completely forgot the name, an interview that he did with one journal. Um, and uh, just reading it, what really struck me was it felt like as if it was written yesterday. Yeah. And this was something that was done in 1970s. And the mission still continues to be the same for us. As you know, the core of our business is uh, science and through aquatic food sustainable management, aquatic food systems. We aspire to end hunger in yeah. the world, right? And that mission is still there. Um, but I guess I think we've been on, on a similar trajectory over the years. And um, maybe slightly moving forward a bit, what's the next big thing I think in this space from a scientific point of view? What's the next big breakthrough that we should aspire to achieve? It wouldn't be a breakthrough if I could predict it. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I think the big yeah. problem mm. we have to deal with is global warming. Uh, mm. the, the, the challenge, the immensity of the challenge that comes on us it, most people don't realize, don't begin to apprehend what it means. Uh, it means that, uh, for example, an African colleague mm. spent three months, three weeks in Ghana, and when she came back, she said, Vancouver is hotter than Ghana, uh, and Vancouver is in Canada in God's name. Uh, and and that that thing, we we will we can adapt or deal with. Uh, uh, air conditioning, we buy an air conditioning machine, we stress the, the electrical system and stuff, but humans can adapt. But biodiversity, we had one billion animals dying uh, uh, along the coast of uh, British Columbia, uh, it's been estimated, in a, in a uh, heat wave of, uh, of that, last, uh, that last week, uh, last year or two years ago. A colleague has been counting one billion animals. Um, and heat waves, what is it, a heat wave? That is that is a piece of the future in the present. Right? A piece of the, the climate and the weather of the future plopped in the present. And what it does is kills animals. And it it causes fires. The, they had a, a village close to where I live. Uh, called Lytton, was burnt. 90%, 95% of the houses burnt after the day after the highest temperature ever recorded in Canada occurred. And it was 49.5 in Canada. And, and the, nothing can survive that. And the forests are burning all the time. So we are in a mess. And we have to deal with that. And if we don't, Everything else becomes secondary. Thank you very much, uh, Daniel. I think what a fascinating conversation, um, very uplifting. We have two minutes to go. Maybe a, yeah, a quick question from uh, yeah, uh, Colin, please, uh, and then yeah. a quick response, and then. Hi, Daniel. Um, with regards to your gear oxygen limitation theory, I was wondering if you could explain the likely implications of it for tropical aquaculture over the next 10, 20 years as 
temperatures increase? Yeah. The quick answer is uh, farm fish that have air breathing uh, capability because uh, because I believe that uh, the temperature is going to be um, is going to pose problem for ob obligate water breathers. And uh, so you have a whole variety of fish that have accessory uh, uh, organs uh, for breathing air and catfish, uh, among others, Anabas and Shana and so on. That would be perhaps glib, but that that uh, is uh, one answer. And another one is uh, is oxygen, getting oxygen into the system because uh, the water will contain less oxygen, the warmer water, and and um, I, I think I think long term is uh, if if aquaculture in, uh, is maintained and stuff, uh, the the social system around it uh, is maintained because all of this is going to be in question. Uh, air breathing fish, <laughs> that's glib, but that is a, a sure bet. Thank you very much, uh, Daniel. So with that, I think let me say first of all, thank you very much, uh, Daniel, for this fascinating uh, presentation, but also very candid responses to the questions as well. I think it's been very genuine, lively conversation we just had and a lot that I have personally learned uh, from your talk and your responses as well. Perhaps the only thing that you haven't done it well is partly because you're too modest is promoting your book uh so if you if you don't mind me you know just sharing that with um colleagues here uh, in the room that uh, i have personally committed to get a copy and uh, to read and the book is titled the oceans whistle blower the remarkable life and work of daniel Pauley. so if you come across it please you know um i, I it uh, I would certainly read, and it's got amazing reviews. Um, so I would definitely will. Well, you, you, you can being the DG, you can grab it the first uh, from the library. Okay. I, I'm donating it to the library. Oh, thank you very much. Well, that's and what I said at the beginning. Oh, thank you, thank you very much, thank you very much, Daniel. Um, yeah. thank you very much, Daniel. That means a lot, really. <laughs> thank you, and welcome to Worldfish once again. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, Daniel Pauli. Thank you. Thank you.